He's on the $20 bill, but how much do you know about John Flynn? The people who live and work in Outback Australia can be confident of help and support when it's needed, even though the distances are vast. However, life there wasn't always like that. Right up to the beginning of the 20th century, the people of the Outback were literally on their own, and life was a daily struggle. The story of how a mantle of safety was created for them is one of the great tales of modern Australian history. I think you sometimes forget how big Australia is and how vast the outback is. And I think even possibly, you please correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I think even possibly for Australians that you don't, understand how vast it is because of modern transport you can get from one uh, one side to the other of australia in in a few hours but you know back then before the royal flying doctor service as it's named now that you were on your own you really were on your own if you if you were in trouble you weren't going to get help uh, and I, I just think that's possibly not appreciated anymore necessarily John Flynn was born in 1880 in Maligal in Victoria, and he became a school teacher after he left school at the age of 18. A few years later, he began his theological studies in Melbourne and joined the Christian ministry. He was 30 before he graduated in divinity. Flynn became interested in working with the people of inland Australia. In his graduation year, he wrote a handbook called The Bushman's Companion, which contained hints for outbackers. It included useful tips like first aid, how to make a will, a selection of hymns and prayers, and an order of service. I think John Flynn was an extraordinary character. Uh, he was somebody who loved people, uh, loved the bush, uh, had a deep faith uh, in God, obviously, and was, was driven by that sense of, of God's calling on his life uh, to give of himself. He was an extraordinarily selfless person. Uh, see... I'm not going to get into the religion side of things really too much, but I hope that he was. I hope that he was doing things because it was the right thing to do, and he and he loved helping people more than because he thought, you know, because it wasn't just because he thought that that's what God wanted him to do. I, you know, I hope it was just him, his general nature. But if take religion out of it. I hope that he would have done that anyway, and that was his character. I really do hope that. At the end of 1910, Flynn accepted a two-year placement at the Smith of Dunesk Mission in Beltana, South Australia. It was the beginning of his dream to work in the outback. This particular mission had been established some years before by a Scottish benefactor, Mrs Henrietta Smith of Dunesk in Scotland and it was pioneered by the Reverend Robert Mitchell. Mitchell spent some years working from Beltana, then handed over to the Reverend Frank Rowland. Rowland was appalled by the lack of medical facilities north of Port Augusta, and he started a campaign for a nurse and possibly the building of a hospital for the settlement. Sister E.A. Maine was appointed in 1907 as the pioneer nurse and was succeeded by Sister Latto Bett three years later. By 1911, the hospital had been built. In that same year, John Flynn was ordained a minister in the Presbyterian Church and was sent to Beltana. He began the work that would one day become folklore in the outback. Flynn continued to dream of ways in which the work of the church could be spread throughout the inland, and he kept in regular contact with the home mission about his ideas. In 1912, the Victorian Home Mission Committee and the Australian Board of Missions, who were in charge of Aboriginal welfare, decided that they needed a survey of conditions in the Northern Territory. The obvious man for the job was, of course, the Reverend John Flynn. He was given two commissions. The first one was to report on the Aborigines, and the second was to investigate the needs of the European settlers. Starting in Darwin, Flynn looked at the land and its resources, the people and their way of life. 
the hardships they faced and their spiritual needs. He then wrote recommendations about the work that he thought needed to be undertaken across the continent. On the 26th of September 1912, Flynn presented his reports to the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. These reports were received with great enthusiasm and Flynn was appointed as the organising agent and superintendent of a special home mission area to address the needs of the settlers. The report on the needs of the Aboriginal people was referred to the overseas mission. John Flynn. It's interesting to, to think that actually they looked at the needs of the, the Aboriginal, uh, the, the, the first people, first nations, uh, but also the European settlers, because actually, I think that's probably the right thing, because their needs may be slightly different. Uh, you know, for example, the, the indigenous people that they, they may be suited a little bit better. I don't know. You know, maybe they don't need as much care from the Europeans as, as the Europeans need. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I may be completely wrong there. Um, but I think the way that the cultures are, you have to be a little bit more careful with, with how you sort of interfere um, with with their current way of life. Flynn uh, had, a, had a nice saying that uh, he believed he was commissioned uh, to bring Christ to the people of inland Australia and to improve their conditions of life. That's the important bit. Improve their conditions of life. That's the important bit. And so that's, in a sense, what the commission to him was. But he saw it in much broader terms, uh, in terms of meeting, seeking to meet all the needs of the people in the outback, not just their spiritual needs. It was a dream come true for the young minister, who set to work at once. Several months later, the project was given the title Australian Inland Mission. The Udnadatta Hostel and the work of Sister Lato Bet, already started by the Smith of Dunesk Mission, was transferred to the Australian Inland Mission. By the end of World War I, it further established nursing hostels at Port Hedland, Maranboy, and Halls Creek, and four patrols. Two of those patrols remained on active service throughout the war. Flynn was still working on his mantle of safety for inland Australia, and he knew that air transport was the way of the future. He'd received a long and detailed letter from Lieutenant Clifford Peel, a young medical student who was passionate about flying. Peel wanted to encourage Flynn Look to create an aerial medical service for the outback. Sadly, Peel was on his way to the war when he wrote that letter. Not long afterwards, he was shot down and killed at the age of 24. Inspired by Clifford Peel's dream, John Flynn campaigned for a decade for an aerial service. Finally, a longtime supporter, Hugh Victor Mackay, left a bequest for an aerial experiment. At the same time, Flynn met the legendary Hudson Fish, a founder of Qantas. With money in hand, in 1928, they set up an aerial ambulance service based in Cloncurry in Queensland. Mm -hmm. Presbyterian Church said to John Flynn, if you can raise another £5,000, then we'll have £7,000 to uh, have a, an experimental effort uh, for an aerial uh, medical service. Think about that now. Just think about that now, how important the air travel is. Air travel is a hell of a lot quicker than, than boat, than car. You know, you don't have to go around things you just fly straight over them uh, and it wouldn't be you know the health and safety things wouldn't be where they are if it wasn't for air travel and and obviously i understand back in back back when this was happening the technology was not great right compared to what we have now so it is more of a risk so John Flynn and one of his uh, staff members, um, uh, the, the Reverend uh, Andrew Barber, set to work to raise this £5,000. They got to 4500 and the last £500, Flynn and Barber had a, had a conversation and said, how about we personally guarantee the last £500? So they agreed, but Andrew Barber said afterwards, that was all right for John Flynn, he didn't have £500 <laughs> to rub together. <laughs> 
During the period that Flynn was campaigning for the Aerial Medical Service, he was also looking for ways of providing better communication for the outback. He'd already approached a World War I veteran named George Towns about wireless technology, and they'd begun experimenting in 1925 with the new equipment. It had potential, so Flynn asked Alfred Traeger to join them as a field radio engineer. Within a year, they'd established a radio signal between Alice Springs and Hermansburg, Brilliant. 130 kilometres apart. Traeger had refined the equipment by developing a compact generator to power the transceiver, but it still needed two people to operate it. By 1927, his further refinements produced a generator powered by pedalling, which allowed single operators to generate power with their feet. What? Wow, wow. So that was also created, a pedal-powered radio. That is incredible, because you've got to get power from somewhere, right? And that makes perfect sense. You don't have electricity everywhere in the outback. So to create that electricity, to create the power, use your feet. You know, you, you get wind-up radios even nowadays. That is brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Later, he added a keyboard, which made the use of Morse code redundant. In 1929, the first single pedal wireless was installed at Augustus Downs near Cloncurry in Queensland. By now, the aerial medical service and the pedal radio were saving countless lives. The church believed that the flying medical staff and the network of radios needed to stand alone. In 1939, the aerial medical service was officially transferred from the Presbyterian Church to a separate organisation. It became known as the Flying Doctor Service of Australia and later the Royal Flying Doctor Service. During this period, the work of the Methodist Church in Outback Australia had begun to expand and in 1926 the Federal Methodist Inland Mission was formed. The Reverend Colonel A.T. Holden was appointed as the first superintendent, followed by the Reverend T.C. Rental, and then by the Reverend Harry Griffiths. John Flynn continued to establish a number of new services and patrols, and in 1939 he was elected Moderator General of the Presbyterian Church. By the time World War II began, the Australian Inland Mission and the Methodist Inland Mission were working closely together. The decision to uh, cooperate between the Presbyterian Methodist congregational work was, was taken very readily by John Flynn and his counterparts in the other two churches. Uh, the Reverend A.T. Holden and Harry Griffiths in the Methodist Church and their counterparts in the Congregational Church, particularly in the Northern Territory and particularly focusing on Darwin and then Alice Springs, uh, but also divvying up some of the uh, regions of Australia and say, well, you send a patrol a minister or patrol padre there, we'll send a padre over here. And so right from the beginning of that work, the sense of cooperation between these Protestant churches uh, was very, very helpful. They form That's interesting. That's interesting. The, you know, two, look, two churches, they've got the same message, but they're, they almost have to cooperate, don't they, to make a success. Otherwise... It's just two messages going at the same time. And I think, yeah, the cooperation is key. ...formed a partnership to provide a recreational club for military and civilian men assigned to Darwin. They also invited the Congregational Church to share in some of that ministry work. And the doors of the club opened in 1940 at the height of the war. It was in 1949 that Flynn began his last project, the Old Timers Settlement in Alice Springs. Two years later, he died from cancer. Flynn's I hate... I hate cancer. It's the worst, right? It is the worst thing. It doesn't matter if you're good, bad. It will get you, you know? And there's no rhyme or reason. Uh, this is a mini rant. But isn't it the worst? It is the worst thing. <sighs> That's it. Flynn's ashes were scattered at the base of Mount Gillen near Alice Springs and in 1953, a memorial was erected at the site. Interestingly, disquiet that the rock on Flynn's grave in Arunta country had been taken from the Kalu Kalu site, known as the Devil's Marbles, resulted in a significant act of reconciliation. 
The rock was deeply sacred to the Kachechi Waramungu people, and in 1996 they formally requested that it be returned to mm. its rightful place. In time, the RNT people of the Alice Springs area offered a replacement rock, which was dedicated at the gravesite in 1999. Wow, that's. I wonder if anyone knew about that. You know, because with the with the indigenous people, you know, they were all separate groups, right? They all had their separate beliefs. They all had their sacred land. And so the, the, the boulder that was put on Flynn's memorial was from from what they believe is their land and it's sacred. And and that's incredible. But save the day, this this group of indigenous uh, people offered theirs. Uh, that's so I would like to think that Flynn must have had some some helped these people and, and influence these people in a, in a real positive way for them to do that kind gesture. In 1956, the John Flynn Memorial Church, the Cathedral of the Outback, was opened in Alice Springs. When they laid the foundation stone of the Flynn Memorial Church in Alice Springs, Bob Menzies, the uh, Prime Minister of the time travelled all the way to Alice Springs. He was a good Presbyterian, mind you, Bob Menzies, but travelled to uh, Alice Springs to lay the foundation stone and to speak so highly of the enormous contribution that John Flynn uh, had made to the uh, nation of Australia. Around the same time, the Methodist, Presbyterian and Congregational churches in the Northern Territory became the United Church of Northern Australia. In 1977, a national union between the churches created the Uniting Church in Australia and the inland work of the churches combined to become Uniting Superintendent. Mackay remained in that role until his retirement in 1974 when he handed over to Max Griffiths. In the same year, A.W. Pedrick was appointed the Federal Director of the Federal Methodist Inland Mission. He was succeeded in 1968 by Harry Mackay. In 1986, Gray Birch became the General Secretary of Frontier Services and was followed six years later by Brian Lewis Smith. As the needs of remote Australia have continued to grow, Frontier Services has found ways to provide the support and services needed by people in remote areas of the continent. Rosemary Young became National Director of Frontier Services in the year 2000. It is exciting to be celebrating a hundred years of something that's been so important to the people of remote Australia. And it's very exciting to look to the future and to what's possible. It's an, a source of enormous satisfaction to me, and I hope to my predecessors, that the organisation has continued to change to meet emerging needs over that hundred years. And I expect that we'll continue to do that into the future. That's why we're relevant today. And I think as we focus on partnerships, on resourcing and sustaining the skills and the confidence in communities that will allow them to provide their own services into the future. So slightly changing the focus from being the service deliverer to being the facilitator, the enabler of those services being provided by people themselves, we've got that wonderful role of partnership ahead of us and something that in time we'll all be able to look at with total pride. John Flynn pioneered the work of the Australian Inland Mission. For 100 years it has allowed the people and communities of remote Australia to put down roots and even prosper because of the mantle of safety he created. Frontier Services acknowledges and celebrates the hope, the spirit and the resilience of the people of remote Australia. It continues to be privileged to stand beside them into the future. Well, there's a little bit on John Flynn. Uh, there is a reason why he's on this note. And I think anyone that lives in the outback, in the bush, would 100% understand why he is on this note. He, you know, whether I agree with the, the religious beliefs, he clearly had a kind heart and wanted to help people and look after people. And if, if it wasn't for him and the flying doctor service, 
wow, what, where would where would these people be that are in the outback so secluded? Where would they be without it? That's the main thing I want to take from this is is that he created that, you know, a service that clearly is, well, is needed by so many people. You know, the vastness of the Australian outback is 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 crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. And it's hard to develop bigger towns and cities to to facilitate the hospitals and doctor surgeries that, that is needed. So the flying the Royal Flying Doctor Service, it was created by John John Flynn and is a necessity. Thank you so much for watching. It was interesting to learn a little bit more about Reverend John Flynn. Make sure you like and subscribe and I will chat here. I will catch you next time.